have received notice from the Minister of Education that he wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by the parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask the question has, of course, been relaxed. Members do still have to make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place. I remind members to be concise in asking their question. This is not an opportunity for debate per se, and all introductions should not be engaged in. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in compliance with Section 52 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, I wish to make the following statement on behalf of Minister Nicullen and myself. On the meeting of the North South Ministerial Council in Education Sector Format, held on Friday the 6th of November uh, 2020. The meeting was conducted via video conference due to the current COVID uh, restrictions. Minister Foley, TD, Minister for Education, Minister McCullen, as accompanying minister myself, attended the meeting. The meeting was cordial and productive, and progress was made on a number of key issues, including the implications of the UK withdrawal from the EU, uh, response to COVID-19, review of the work programme, update on EU funding, uh, educational underachievement, special educational needs, uh, school, youth and teacher exchanges, teacher qualifications and cooperation between the inspectorates. And I will take each of those items in turn. On the implications of UK withdrawal from the EU, the Council noted the current assessment of the likely implications for the education sector arising from the UK's withdrawal from the EU and welcomed the commitments made uh, to take all necessary measures to ensure that the agreed common travel area uh, rights and privileges are protected. Ministers also welcomed the commitments made uh, to the Future Peace Plus programme and the work that is underway to develop a programme. Ministers reaffirmed their commitment to continued uh, cooperation in education issues following the conclusion of the transition period. In terms of COVID-19, uh, ministers welcomed the commitment of all teaching staff in both jurisdictions to deliver remote learning to, to pupils. They noted the importance and context of the successful reopening of schools, a core policy objective in both jurisdictions, in accordance with hygiene and public health protocols. The Council noted the uh, heightened concern of education ministers for pupils with complex and additional learning needs, and acknowledged the uh, efforts of teaching and other critical support uh, staff to maintain student relationships and connections with schools. The agreement of the education ministers and their officials uh, to continue uh, sharing information in advance notice of key decisions where practical was also welcomed. The Council expressed its uh, appreciation uh, to all staff engaged in the delivery of education in these exceptional times. It was also welcomed that the uh, that education ministers would convene a meeting of senior uh, departmental officials along with the agency's bodies responsible to invite and support areas and report findings to the next S NSMC meeting in this sector. The NSMC noted the commitment to review the work programme uh, and the plan to convene a meeting of senior officials from relevant departments, co-chaired by the Secretary-General and the Permanent Secretary of the Education Departments, to make recommendations for a future work programme. Uh, on EU funding, the Ministers noted the impact of COVID-19 has had on Peace uh, for funded shared education projects. They also noted that to address the challenges posed by COVID-19, the use of online technologies to promote the objectives of shared education was being explored. The high-level engagement uh, that has taken place between departments on Peace Plus, the draft proposals for Peace Plus in relation to the theme of youth, and the potential for ambitious and innovative proposals under Peace Plus to promote respect and understanding on a cross-border and cross-community basis were noted by the Council. On educational underachievement, the NSMC noted the lessons learned and uh, recommendations from the final evaluation report on the North-South um, Underachievement Practitioners Engagement Project, which was published uh, by Cooperation Ireland in July 2017. The NSMC noted the appointment of the expert panel by myself under the New Decade uh, New Approach Agreement to examine the links between persistent educational uh, underachievement and socio-economic background and draw up an action plan to uh, change for change that will ensure all children and young people, regardless of background, are given the best start in life. And this was noted by ministers. Research on the uh, Delivering Equality of Opportunity in Schools programme uh, has been provided as part of the evidence base to the panel, 
and the panel will produce an interim report and draft action plan by the 31st of March 2021, and a final action plan, including implementation costs and timescales, by the 31st of May 2021. On special educational needs, the uh, ministers welcomed the progress being made by the two educational departments and Middletown Centre for Autism to facilitate and maintain the delivery of the centre's range of, of services since the last meeting in 2016. The Council welcomed the efforts of uh, Middletown Centre for Autism management and staff to remain operational and the continued delivery of elements of their service throughout the COVID-19 restrictions. The proposed delivery plan for the centre, which takes account of the impacts of COVID-19 and the delay in making board appointments, was noted. The NSMC noted that MCA has, been, uh, has considered the potential implications of the UK withdrawal from the EU. The Council also noted um, recent developments in the delivery of special educational needs programmes in both jurisdictions. On school youth and teacher exchanges, the Council noted North-South exchanges in the area of youth work practices and the ongoing activities of the North-South Education and Training Standards for Youth Work. On teacher qualifications, the NSMC noted the procedures being explored to facilitate reciprocal uh, recognition of teacher qualifications in the context of a UK withdrawal from the EU. It also noted the update on the agreement on the Marino Institute of Education and St Mary's University College uh, regarding the delivery of SCG. The Council was advised at the 18th Annual Conference of Teacher Education uh, North and South on the theme of teacher education in the COVID movement took place online on the 21st of October uh, 2020. Ministers welcomed the continuing collaboration of the education inspectorates covering capacity building for education and training inspectorates uh, inspection of new Irish medium education, the ongoing programme of inspection and change exchanges, and joint working on inspections, the collaborative support in carrying out independent evaluation and projects, the cooperation between management uh, and both inspectors. In closing, uh, Mr. Speaker, my officials uh, and I look forward to meeting with Minister Foley and her department uh, as we meet the challenges of responding to the current. Uh, health crisis and the future challenges and opportunities that will be presented as the UK leaves the European Union. Thank you, and I call Chris Little, Chairperson of the uh, Education Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I note the concern for pupils with complex needs expressed by the Education Minister in this statement. However, the families of children with complex needs in Northern Ireland who feel abandoned by him during COVID-19 need action, leadership and support, not concern. So can I ask the Education Minister why then his £11.3 million Engage programme funding for school restart did not include special schools when launched in September? Could a, sorry, Minister, could I suggest that, that the member's question does not entirely relate to the statement, but I would leave that as a matter of discretion for the Minister if he wishes to answer. And I'm sorry, Minister, could I make the point that I mean, just remind the Minister that if members are asking questions that relevant to the statement, then it is entirely down to the Minister whether to accept the question or not. Thank you. Minister. Very specifically, I appreciate that, so I'm not. Uh it does not directly relate to the statement. However, we have given instructions to the EA to work the, in terms of special educational needs. We should remember, first of all, that in terms of the Engage programme, it is across schools, and so therefore, for the vast majority of children that are statemented, for instance, they would be operating through mainstream schools, which will enable that. On the issue, I suppose, of direct intervention for children that are in special schools, I think there is a need for something that is more bespoke and individually exercised. So we've asked the EA, which is overall responsibility in terms of special education leads, to work with those schools and work with the individuals within that, to try and make sure that there is any level of academic catch-up takes place for them. I call Robin Newton. Mr Speaker, can I go to the same item? Uh, Minister on the special educational needs. When in the discussions, have you noted any radical differences between the approach being used in Northern Ireland on the basis of addressing the needs of our young pupils and indeed the approach used by the Minister in the Republic of Ireland? I think there is a realisation discussion that, that did take place during the NSMC meeting in relation to uh, special educational needs. That principally focused on the, the Middletown Centre, which is obviously the one area that is of direct common concern. 
However, I think there has been an acceptance um, that there is a need um, and that indeed there was probably a limited level of supply of support in terms of schools being open during the early parts of the pandemic across the board. And in particular, probably there was a limited uh, amount of support that was there for special educational needs. There is, I think, a strong imperative on particularly special schools uh, to be open. At, at currently, I was able to visit uh, last week um, Arvely in Oma, uh, which provides a, a considerable service. And it goes beyond simply the educational provision that is there. It is critical from the point of view of the development of children, from a social point of view that they are. And in terms of North South, I think there is a common determination to try to see that schools are open, kept open as much as possible and prioritised. And I think nowhere is that uh, more important than for children with special educational needs. I call Cara Mullen. Thank you, Cora. Thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, can I ask the Minister, in relation to ongoing and future cooperation, what his assessment is of the impact that COVID has had on cross-border shared education projects? And Minister, I would also ask that you restore the funding to school tens and that your officials would meet with the committee to discuss this. Thank you. Well, in reverse order, I'm due to meet, I think, with representatives of Scotans, I think, at the end of this month, so we'll be able to discuss uh, that, that level of, of support. Uh, obviously, I can't prejudge any outcome until I have that, that meeting. In terms of shared education, um, and I had previous week, I know, I think, Mr Murphy had given a report on the SEUPB, which obviously leads into uh, some of the, the peace funding. Uh, it is the case that, that that all the projects have been able to continue to move ahead. However, there has been uh, a level of reorientation um, of those projects, particularly with regards to shared education. It has therefore been at this stage about shared learning. A lot of that has been done online. And I think one of the um, many difficulties that has arisen from COVID is that shared education is something which I think manifestly everyone would accept is a benefit. But the, the overriding driver in shared education is those shared direct experiences of people meeting face to face. And at the moment, um, as within schools, we're trying, I suppose, to, uh, in terms of the health protections, ensure that there's as little mixing between schools as possible, even as little mixing within schools, so that, that quite often uh, classes have to effectively bubble themselves. That, that creates a direct face to face barrier, which then acts in a counterintuitive way to what wants to happen in terms of shared education. However, shared education is being taken forward. Um, the projects themselves are, have been able to continue. There's been nothing from that point of view that's been abandoned. But a lot of this has had to shift towards more that sharing of experience, much more towards an online experience. Uh, but I think there was a, a shared indication um, from everyone that the sooner we can move back to a point which, from a safe point of view, we can actually get that direct interaction particularly between students, also involving teachers as well, on a shared education basis, I think the better that we can get the, the richest harvest uh, from that particular investment. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, can I first of all thank you for uh, visiting my own constituency, uh, Arvely School, a fantastic uh, school uh, 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 in Oma, uh, and I'm sure your, the, your visit was very much um, uh, welcomed. Uh, can I commend you also, uh, both ministers, in fact, uh, for your commitment to collaborate uh, and cooperate over the range of matters outlined in the paper? I am alarmed, though, Minister, to note that these conversations are at such an early stage, given that we are so far on in the, on, on the transition period, which is due to end in January. Procedures are being explored to facilitate reciprocal recognition of qualifications north, south, in light of Brexit. Should this not have been completed sooner, Minister? How advanced are these explorations, and can you give a date or time? And further, is there an, an issue with the ETA in relation to the Irish medium sector? Thank you, Minister. Well, I'm not aware of any particular problems that ETI have with the, the Irish medium sector directly in, in that regard. Obviously, there's a, been a restriction on what ETI has been able to do throughout the pandemic. And indeed, as with others, at least on a temporary basis, ETI has had to reorientate itself. Now, I think that the work that ETI and EA have done in terms of providing link officers with schools has been very useful. But the level of inspection and input, uh, now, I think there's probably a strong case that that should operate on a more thematic basis anyway in terms of inspection. But there's clearly been a degree of, of change within that. Uh, you know, we're giving us a report on where we are at present on that, but we did have an opportunity whenever the, uh, although it was not formally an education sector format, whenever the NSMC met during the summer in uh, Dublin Castle, um, the, there was then a, a writing out of that a meeting in which 
there was a, a touching on a, a number of those issues that was able to be taking place, but we have a direct uh, informal one-to-one -one meeting between myself and Minister Foley, who at that stage was relatively new uh, in post. Uh, as regards that, in terms of mutual recognition, um, the position, I suppose, is that that has been something that previously had been facilitated through the EU. Um, I think there is good work that has been going on that can may well be that as part of the overall settlement that uh, arises, if it arises, between the UK and the EU, that mutual recognition of qualifications is something uh, which there is a level of acceptance on. As, is, as I said, there is a, uh, there's work ongoing to see then what can be done on a bilateral basis. And it's noticeable, which would then fit in neatly with that level of uh, recognition, that within the um, internal markets bill that is passing through the UK Parliament, there is those mutual recognitions between the various jurisdictions within the United Kingdom, because, as the member will be aware, teaching councils, for instance, will operate in different formats in different parts uh, of not just the United Kingdom, but the Republic of Ireland as well. I think one of the things that the pandemic has shown is the need for mutual recognition of qualifications, because, particularly as regards teaching, we don't know at what stage in different jurisdictions people will actually seek beyond their own boundaries, and it's not just in the issue of, of education beyond their own boundaries to uh, be able to draw um, and seek, if you like, both experience and help from outside their own jurisdiction. So I think that there, there's a broader critical element in terms of dealing with the mutual recognition of qualifications, but that is ongoing to try at least to create a bilateral arrangement uh, with, between the UK and the Republic of Ireland on teaching qualifications. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Minister for your answers so far. I want to just probe a little bit more into the teaching qualifications. Um, as you know, here in Northern Ireland, we have those teachers that go through the, go through Stranmillis and St Mary's. Then we have the other teachers in relation to uh, postgraduate qualifications. Uh, what, sort of work, uh, what sort of work has been done to look at those qualifications, both, both sides of the border? And secondly, what sort of talks have been going on with GTC Northern Ireland and GTC Republic of Ireland to make sure that the qualifications are recognised either way? Thank you. Thank the member for her questions. Uh, obviously, you should be aware GTC and I will look after it from a Northern Ireland perspective. TCI will look after as the equivalent registration body. And it's about ensuring then that, that those who have got, for instance, a UK B Ed or PGC qualifications are able to um, obtain registration with TCI and similarly the TCI registered teachers can be recognised uh, in terms of GTC uh, NI. So elements of the, the current um, mutual recognition arrangements are based on the EU Mutual Re Recognition of Professional Qualifications Directive. Now that will cease at the end of the EU period but the process to assess and it's also the case that um, applicants from outside of that will also need to be assessed um, the fact that, that um, I think the UK government as a whole, which will be handling uh, some of the, the qualifications, is keen to see that there's professional mobility uh, and that indeed particularly that uh, the common travel area will also then reflect that uh, as well. Um, so what I think we were aiming to see is a, is a seamless internal UK labour market for professionals and that the, the bilateral could comprehensively address any future teacher recognition arrangements. That, that those would then be sorted out. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister, in his statement, noted that both education ministers had considerable concern for pupils with complex and special educational needs. Does he agree with me that the benefit these children get from being able to attend schools is significant, and that this is a further reason to ensure schools remain open as we face the challenges ahead in dealing with COVID-19? And it's probably a similar sort of question previously was asked. I think the significance of ensuring then that, that schools remain open, I think, is paramount for all our pupils, but it's particularly focused in on those with special educational needs. And I think that that is something which is shared um, on both sides, of the, both sides of the border. It's noticeable that, for instance, within the Republic of Ireland, which is, um, has its different um, levels of COVID restrictions, that there's been despite the fact that they've moved to level five, that's been on the basis then of protecting uh, institutions of, of education, particularly schools. Uh, and as indicated, I think, from any experience of meeting um, children with special educational needs, I think it is particularly important 
uh, that schools are kept open on a face-to-face -face basis from a learning point of view, but also from a broader social point of view, from also sending out any form of uh, signal that there's got to be recognition of every, every child across the system. So I think that that is something, and broadly speaking, the issue, while the principal focus in terms of special education needs was on the specifics of Middletown, in the discussions that was held between myself and Minister Foley, I think that's something that's been recognised in terms of the importance of both schools open, but particularly for special educational needs pupils, is recognised both sides of the border and indeed beyond uh, these shores as well. I think what has happened in Great Britain has also shown a desire to ensure that schools are kept open as a top priority. I think that's something that the executive shares. Call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, can I ask the Minister if the proposed review of the forward work programme is due to consequences of COVID? And can you comment on the extent of the impact that COVID has had on the work programme? Well, I think there's, there's a good opportunity with um, the executive having resumed this year with uh, a new government and the Republic having resumed. There is an opportunity for a level of stock take and to see what, what can happen in terms of forward, forward work programme. You know, all these things are, are always a certain level of, of work in progress. I suppose where there has been across a number of sectors in education, uh, not just here but in other jurisdictions as well, there's no doubt that COVID has had a level of, of, of impact um, on that. Uh, because what, um, to some extent, from, I think, Department of Education here, the Republic of Ireland as well, uh, there has been a shifting of whatever staff is available to fight the immediate issues of, of COVID, and that has meant on a range of issues. Um, so, for example, in, under this area planning, for instance, that, that there has been a shift away from that to what has ha had to happen immediately. Similarly, I think any level of engagement of future work programme, there's no doubt there's probably been a level of time delay that has been created uh, by that. But I suppose it's, it is also, I suppose, if we take at least some element of positive out of COVID, it's also how we apply some of the lessons of COVID and actually see, are there better ways of, of and, and a lot of this will be on the basis of sharing of information, sharing of best practice, sharing of knowledge. Uh, are there ways actually that we can learn from COVID to be able to provide better ways for our young people and actually, if you like, capture some of the, um, maybe sort of sometimes accidental successes that have, that have occurred because of COVID and try and apply that across the education system? I call William Humphrey. Thank the Minister for his statement to the House and the answer so far. Minister, you made mention of the expert panel to examine uh, educational underachievement. Um, I appreciate and understand that that panel is to report in the spring of next year. This is a hugely important and significant issue in North Belfast and Greater Shankill. Can I ask the Minister to update the House on the progress the panel has made to date? Of aspects to that, obviously, in particular regards on the NSMC meeting, uh, there has obviously been engagement prior to this on, um, with experts in terms of underachievement, sharing levels of experience, and that I think will be something that will be fed in. And there's also mention, particularly, of the um, DEIS uh, work that can also feed in, which will be part of that. The panel itself, um, I suppose, started in September. Uh, my understanding is that up until uh, the middle of October, uh, the online consultation in terms of people looking to make direct responses to it. There were 401 responses, and I understand that uh, over the period up until January 2021, there's at least 20 oral sessions that have been established by the um, educational panel, and as indicated earlier, with the aim to have a completed report by May of 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to welcome the Minister's statement. Just Following on from the educational underachievement, I mean, in terms of, of similar initiatives and what we've learned and opportunities to enhance cooperation with your southern counterparts, could you expand a wee bit on that? And in relation to, you mentioned the final evaluation report. What lessons have you learned in relation to that, Gormil Maggot? Well, the evaluation report from the expert panel point of view, that, that information has been fed into the expert panel and been provided to them, along with a wide range of other pieces of, of evidence. Uh, and, you know, across Across the board, yes, there has been one of the advantages, I suppose, at least particularly for the expert panel in terms of underachievement, is that there's a bank of knowledge that is there, there's a bank of good experience. Whether that is happening in the Republic of Ireland, other parts of Northern Ireland, uh, or indeed England, Scotland, Wales, or internationally can, can feed into it. So, you know, 
I, I think none of us should be conceited enough to believe that we always have all the answers to everything. I think we can learn uh, a level of experience, and I think that will be fed in uh, across the board to the expert panel in, in how things are tackled. Sometimes that is not simply about actually copying things which have worked successfully. It, it may also be at times here's something which was tried, didn't work, here's something to avoid. So it's, you know, it's about gaining all that um, rich experience and having that uh, feeding in from different points towards the, the panel. I call Justin McNulty. Minister, Minister, a young woman is fighting for her, her life in hospital not far from here after a domestic violence issue at the weekend. I'm sure the Minister will join me in wishing her well and recognise the important role of education to teach our young people about respect. I know it's not connected to the statement. Minister, can I, can I commend all those who have continued to work throughout this pandemic to provide support for children? I want to focus on the issue of special educational needs and the Middletown Centre for Autism, which is in my constituency. We are all too aware of the constant battles being fought by parents of children with additional needs. Does the Minister agree with me that there, are, there, are needs, there needs to be a significant focus of policy and resources to tackle the lag in providing support and services once a diagnosis has been confirmed from the statement of need to the provision of therapies? Furthermore, the issue of the sudden drop-off in services when a child hits his or her 19th birthday. Will the Minister undertake to ask the Middletown Centre for Autism to carry out an urgent review of those two areas of work and make recommendations for action and change across this island. Say as, uh, first of all, join. I know it's not part of the statement. I join in wishing a speedy recovery to the lady that uh, the member raised. I'm not aware of the individual case, but domestic abuse is always completely wrong. And I think it's right why there, there is, within this assembly, legislative focus um, on that. Look, I would commend, I think, the, the work of the Middletown Centre, again, has been had some level of disruption because of COVID, but has been able to continue on. It has, indeed, in terms of particularly its online work, been able then to provide that level of support to parents. Um, and I'm sure the member has been down, but I would certainly commend any member to go down to Middletown to see the good work that is being done. It, it, interestingly enough, um, is a centre which, in terms of probably what was plan A for the centre going back, six, seven, eight years, or however long it was, actually wasn't realised, but actually Plan B turned out to be a better uh, vehicle within that. Um, within that context, uh, in terms of support for facilities, um, obviously part of the current uh, SEN regulations that we're actually, that's out to consultation, the, the idea of that is to have earlier interventions, which would mean then that it could feed through into to better solutions at a later stage. Directly speaking, um, I think that Ultimately, in terms of the precise uh, detail from an operational point of view of what Middletown does, I think to some extent there's got to be a level of room for manoeuvre for them themselves. I don't particularly want to direct them towards that, but I'd, I'd be keen to work with them. And I suppose one of the levels which is, has not really stopped the operational side of things, but it was a consequence, I think, of the um, election in the Republic and then the, the period of time which governments were filled. There, there are a number of vacancies at management level that need to be put on to uh, MCA from the uh, Republic side, and there was insurance given by the Minister that, that would happen fairly rapidly. That will, I think, give them a bit more of a, an additional opportunity to have that strategic governance uh, within uh, Middletown Centre. And I look forward to them continuing to deliver for parents and young people um, with uh, autism, and consequently, I think, using their expert skills. Uh, and that indeed considering, as the member suggested, maybe whatever future directions of, of travel they need to take uh, to be able to enhance those services. Call Robbie Butler. Mr Speaker, um, um, we'll, we'll stay on topic if that's okay, Minister, uh, with regard to special education needs and Middletown Centre, and I would echo your call that if any member hasn't been to Middletown to take a trip down to see the wonderful work they do. Minister, you'll also be aware that there are around 40,000 pupils in, in Northern Ireland who have ADHD. It's, it's one of those... Um, uh, things that isn't often talked about and sometimes overlooked. Could you make a commitment today to uh, bring this up as a, a topic and also update the House with regards to any work that may be being done on that area, please? Whenever he says as a, as a topic, we want to ensure that particularly as across the board that there is that provision for special educational needs. I think some of the areas, particularly around training, have been held up again by COVID, and I think we need to actually see what the best way to, to deliver that. You know, I'm not sure there is a specific cross, if, if we're saying it's a topic within NSMC, obviously that tends to focus in on whether there are cross-border jurisdictional aspects. I'm not quite sure whether there's a very specific cross-border element to that, but if the member has any further information, I'm sure I'll be happy to explore that. 
And I call Sinead Annis. Um, there's been considerable focus today on uh, Middletown edu uh, Autism um, Centre, and rightly so. Can the Minister um, advise the extent of cross-border movement in terms of children and young people with special educational needs accessing services like those at Middletown Autism Centre, and what, if any, uh, impact the onset of Brexit will have for these young people accessing those services? Well, the member will be aware that uh, in the broader level on it, with the common travel area, there shouldn't be any particular obstruction to children moving north-south or south-north in terms of that. And to that extent, where while there will be a need for Middletown to fit into whatever overall jigsaw is there in terms of the uh, EU sort of situation, uh, you know, I don't think that that's, that should lead to a particular level of dis uh, disruption to that. And I would be confident that that will be the case for the Middletown Centre. Very specifically, I think that as regards COVID, yes, there's been a change to what the Middletown Centre has been able to provide with comp for children with complex needs during lockdown. Um, where that has meant, and I think because again, and, and, and it is part of, as I said, a wider problem, which is there for shared education in the short term, which is physically bringing uh, children uh, long distances, bringing them to potentially mix in circumstances with children from completely different areas, completely different schools, has been something, obviously, unfortunately, we've had to insulate uh, against. And I know, for instance, in the Republic of Ireland, there has also been, I suppose, the issue of there's been specific, uh, at least guidance, if not regulation, on how far any individual can move on that basis. However, there has been a continuation of services, and so uh, even during the period between uh, sort of... Uh, between March and June of this year, uh, there has been a, a range of uh, webinars via Zoom that MCA have run uh, for pupils in relation to that. Uh, there has also been, um, indeed, both that online support and there's now beginning of um, events which will involve directly schools themselves with, with M uh, MCA. It's about trying to balance out what is there from a health point of view, but also then providing that service. And I'm confident that MCA has adapted and will continue to adapt. But I think all of us will hope for the, the situation in the relatively near future where those, any level of restrictions in terms of mixing can be, can be lifted and as much as possible we can resume as close to normal as, as possible. I call Colin Gilder now. John Corlea, and I too would acknowledge the, the brilliant work done by Middletown. I have had the opportunity to visit and meet with them. Um, but, Minister, there have been significant failings in the area of special educational needs provision here in recent years, and as a consequence, thousands of our young people have been seriously let down. Given that SEN provision was discussed at the, at the North South Ministerial Council, can the Minister tell us what difficulties ex exist in this area in the South and what can be learned from its response to these difficulties? Well, I'll be honest with the, the Member, while SEN was discussed, um, the principal area of detail was, was Middletown, so there wasn't too much detail directly drawn in terms of issues that have, have happened down south. I think it would be the case that no jurisdiction has got this entirely uh, correctly. I think arising out of a number of the reports that have taken place, there is a, a wider governance group that has been established, that the department has established with EA, to make sure those are all drawn together and we're not pulling in different directions. But it's also the case, I think, certainly as regards here, that there is a level of importance in terms of the SEN regulations and code of practice. But I suppose in terms of the detail of precisely comparing what has happened north-south, um, was not probably gone into great detail, I have to say, at the, uh, at the NSMC meeting. It may be something that will be touched on at a later stage. I'll call Colin McGrath. Thank the Minister for his statement. Um, the statement makes reference to draft proposals for Peace Plus on the theme of youth, and also that you noted um, about north south exchanges in the area of youth work practices. Was there any sense of um, any initiatives or plans that might be developed to enhance uh, north south exchanges for young people, especially within youth services, obviously in a, a post COVID world, but obviously preparations that are made in the coming uh, period of time will help to deliver those maybe uh, from the summertime of next year onwards, and will there be any impact from Brexit upon any of those initiatives that might take place? Again, I think sort of that common sense cooperation shouldn't be impacted adversely by Brexit. Directly speaking, I suppose, in terms of uh, there is uh, a direct working relationship on some of the youth side of it between Education Authority and National Youth Council. So there's that ongoing dialogue. 
Uh, obviously, I think the direct exchanges in terms of young people, be it either the youth side of it or school side of it, on a, on a personal basis have been, um, uh, have been, at least in the short term, educationally impacted um, by, uh, by COVID. There is a range on the, uh, obviously, as the member will be aware, uh, while there's been some adjustments to the Peace 4 programme, in terms of Peace Plus, uh, there is then that support uh, uh, within, uh, within that to uh, look at, if you like, and scoping out a range of proposals regards Peace Plus. Those would uh, look towards the continuation of, uh, there are, at this stage, I think, um, there's an ambitious set that's been sent to DOF and SEUPB for consideration. Uh, four aspects that have been identified are continuation of shared education, uh, the North-South Schools Exchange Programme, focusing in particularly on 15 to 16-year-olds, education under achievement, and uh, supporting learning through technology in education, and a fifth proposal is being finalised on integrated education. Uh, and as indicated, there will be specific work, I think, that will focus in on the youth sector side of it. The detail of that, I think, will come from the National Youth Council and the Education Authority. Call Meg Nesbitt. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Minister's statement made reference to delivering equality of opportunity in schools, an initiative in the Republic that began, I believe, in 2005. So I'd be grateful if the Minister could list his sense of the achievements of DEIS over the last 15 years. Detail of that, I'm not going to comment on the individual elements of this because that report has gone to the Education Under Achievement Group. They will be working through that and taking that level of advice. It is about, as I said, learning. and It is also the case where there's been good work done through DEIS uh, from the practical point of view in any jurisdiction, are there still problems with education under achievement? Yes, there are. And it's about that level of mutual learning that can take place. I call Matthew O'Toole. Matthew O'Toole is not in the seat. I call Jim Allister. Uh, the matter of teacher qualifications. In Northern Ireland, of course, the most appalling issue is the discrimination that arises from the Catholic certificate. Uh, has that yet been addressed, and is there a cross-border element to that in respect of uh, teachers from here wanting to teach in the Republic? Well, I think from that point of view, it's about mutual recognition of um, qualifications. It is something I want to see addressed, but obviously as this particularly relates to Northern Ireland, I would regard it as an internal matter to Northern Ireland, and consequently we've got to be very careful that we don't bring into a cross-jurisdictional basis something which should be the purview of Northern Ireland itself. I call Jerry O'Carroll. Jerry Carl. Thank you. Uh, was there any discussion, Minister, at the meeting uh, about the ASTI Teaching Union recent decision to vote for strike action over safety concerns and education in the South? There is joint concern amongst uh, teaching staff over schools and the spread of the virus in it, and people want to know what both jurisdictions, uh, both ministers, are doing to, to tackle these uh, concerns. Again, from the point of view of respecting um, the individual position of jurisdictions. Obviously, the potential strike it is a union which does not operate in Northern Ireland. Consequently, that any strike action would be a matter for the Republic of Ireland. It is not my role to interfere in the internal affairs of Northern Ireland. It is undoubtedly the case that a range of mitigations have been put in place. And indeed, across the board, I think um, either today or yesterday, there is a report from the Office of National Statistics which would suggest that the uh, amount of COVID within education staff is no different to the population as a whole. There's no reason to suggest that there is any particular driver within schools uh, that in any way places this at a higher level than anywhere else. And that has not just been the experience uh, of the Office of National Statistics throughout the United Kingdom, but similarly studies done by the European Centre for Disease Control have indicated that education staff, the levels of COVID are absolutely no different to the rest of the population. And my focus, apart from anything else, it, it is undoubtedly the case that um, a union, even if it's another jurisdiction, will want to look after its members. That is effectively the role of a trade union. Uh, my role is, is somewhat wider. My role is to try to ensure particularly that the education of our young people is protected. And it is undoubtedly the case that the best place for the future of our young children in terms of education, in terms of their mental health, in terms of socialisation, is them being directly in schools. And I will fight to defend uh, schools remaining open while always examining and taking public health advice as to any mitigating measures need to be taken to be able to protect everyone within schools. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, at the end of your statement, you um, set out uh, 
that you discussed with Minister Foley, the challenges of the, and the opportunities presented by the UK leaving the EU. Given what you've said around difficulties in terms of mutual recognition of teachers' qualifications, various other north-south exchange programmes presented by Brexit, could you please tell us, enlighten us as to what the opportunities are for young people? The opportunities are a wider issue in terms of Brexit. The point I suppose I'm making is that uh, we're working through any issues with regards to mutual recognition, which has got to be done on a UK-wide basis and a bilateral basis. It is also the case, I think, there's been steps taken that both in terms of early agreement, because it was one of the uh, one of the, the, I think, false concerns that was raised by some, although I appreciate it not by the member, uh, at an early stage, would this try to prevent uh, cross-border access? Common travel area was something that has been recognised very early and indeed be accepted by all at a very early stage within the EU. So the practical implications, for instance, we have a number of children, a number of staff who will work on one side of the border and live on the other side of the border. That, to the common travel area, is one that is largely speaking um, was sorted out quite a long time ago. And some of the very positive advantages that are there from the point of view of um, Peace Plus uh, is, is one that has been recognised. I, I would say some of the positive aspects of Brexit are having a sovereign nation back again and ensuring that uh, as a country we can establish our, our own laws. And children here can grow up with the confidence to know that they're living in a, in a sovereign uh, nation, not one that will simply be dictated to by bureaucrats in Brussels. That concludes questions on the statement members and can I ask members to take a ease for a moment or two and please uh, do so whilst uh, maintaining full compliance with the social distancing regulations. Thank you.